Washington football. Woo! Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Burgundy Zone. I am your host, Kyle, and I'm joined by my two co-hosts, Michael Hall and Michael Reed. But we are joined by very, very special guest, former tight end for the Washington football team, Logan Paulson. How are you doing, sir? I'm good, man. Thank you guys for having me on. Really appreciate it. Uh, absolutely. And the timing could not be more perfect, uh, Logan, because uh, the tight end for the Washington football team had a phenomenal weekend uh, on Sunday. So in your opinion, I have to get right to it. Do you, a lot of discussion is about Logan Thomas and how good he is as a tight end. Do you think that he is a tight end one in this league? You know, it's so interesting. Uh, with any position in the NFL, it's all about opportunity, right? And Logan Thomas, for a couple of years now, has kind of been on this very nice ascension in terms of his play and his production and learning the position because he played quarterback. Obviously, you know, everyone in the area seems to know that he, you know, went to Virginia Tech, played quarterback there, kind of new to the position. And I think, um, you know, I, I used to have this argument with like Chris Cooley, for example, and guys that I played with. It's all about opportunity and your chance to kind of find a niche and a role in an offense. Like, mm. is he a number one in a different offense? like probably not but here in this system he seems to work really well and like I personally think they could be using him a little bit more and expanding that role and expanding that opportunity mm. but yeah I think for as of right now you know I think he could be a serviceable number one I think he's done a great job this year but one thing that I've always that I learned during my time in the NFL like talking with GMs talking with head coaches is that like they're always looking to upgrade it's just about where in the triage of upgrade your position lies right so mm. I think right now if I'm the Washington football team if I'm the GM of the team I feel pretty good about him and his production this year so I, I think there's a really high likelihood you come in next year but then you know like there's this kid from Florida out there I forget his name Kyle Pitts yeah Kyle Pitts and he looks like he could be something really special so yeah. if that guy falls to you where you're picking you know like it might not it might be just best player available and then you know Logan Thomas is su suddenly relegated to, uh, to that two spot but that wouldn't be any that wouldn't be because of him that's just because there's like freak mutants out there that are really good at football <laughs> you know what I mean six six wide receiver right, right. types Right. Yeah, and uh, you kind of mentioned the off uh, the offense and how they're using Logan Thomas. Uh, how what's your grade of Scott Turner been in the offense so far, and kind of maybe what are some things that you could kind of do to maybe use Logan Thomas more, like you just mentioned? Yeah, I think that's really tough, man. I like I you know everyone gets gets on the the head coach and the head coach has a ton of responsibility, but if you're not like behind the scenes, you don't really understand that that guy is usually kind of in and like an administrative role he kind of handles schedules he handles play time he deals with you know um you know the owner that kind of thing and the guys that are really like in the football x's and o's are the coordinators and that is like one of the most challenging positions on the staff is the offensive coordinator because you're really like i was thinking about it you know uh being a rookie play caller and like you're you're kind of always gambling every single time like when i was reviewing right. the film today i was like you know this is a good play call but the defensive coordinator just happened to kind of be in this other defense that he wasn't expecting. Mm. And as a result, it ends up being an interception. And that's not necessarily on Scott Turner. You know, obviously like the play that he called, if he got the coverage that he wanted would have been a huge play, but it's about kind of playing those odds and playing those things. And I think, you know, you said, what can I like, what would I grade him at? I think probably like a C plus ish area. And I think because he has shown a maturation and evolution, it's so hard. Like when you don't have, good quarterback play you know and, I, and I'm kind of I, I'm referring to Haskins obviously but I'm also referring to Alex Smith like yeah. Alex Smith while he's done a lot for this offense is still not like what he was and even when he was kind of at uh, the top of his game he wasn't mm -hmm. like a, a franchise changing quarterback which I think is what a lot of people are looking for now so I think he's done a decent job if I you know if I was the offensive coordinator for the Washington football team I'd be running the football more I would have established that identity but that's kind of my philosophy so I can't mm -hmm kind of impart that view on him because like that's not who he is and they seem to be having a lot of especially the last you know four or five weeks been very effective kind of with this short intermediate kind of lateral passing attack and converting on third down and so you know that's the name of the game right is being efficient on mm -hmm. offense and they seem to be doing that and uh, at a high level or a, or a better level than they were early in the year so and you know and also he seems to be challenging himself with formations and motions and things like that which i think is important but yeah i think c plus and you know I, I, you have to caveat that by saying he's in a really really tough spot no off season right. kind of spotty quarterback play it's a tough spot to be in right yeah and you mentioned 
that you you would run the ball more. You mentioned you would establish the running game. I'm just going to be straight up with you. How important is Antonio Gibson to this offense? You know, it's interesting. I saw like he is been so surprising to me just in general. Like mm. he, you know, you th- you hear about a receiver switching positions, and you kind of right. question whether they have the toughness or the resiliency to get that done. But he he's he's got this kind of magical running style like he seems right. to break a tackle every single play yeah. makes a guy miss he's this big body guy but he's got kind of this amazing athletic dexterity and um really kind of a unique talent on mm. not expecting that at all he when, I, you know, like when you read about him right running the ball yeah. um and so i think one of the things that in terms of his production his production comes in kind of these unique kind of game plan <clears throat> excuse me game plan type plays or when the team's ahead right which has not been a ton this season and i think one of the things that I've noticed is that this offensive line is kind of starting to gel a little bit more. And I think as much as you want to talk about Antonio Gibson, you got to talk about the O-line yeah, and definitely. they come on at times in the run game in a really nice way, but other times like they don't seem like they're quite on the same page. And I will say like of all the stuff you do offensively, the run game in terms of cohesion on the offensive line is kind of at the pinnacle, maybe pass protection, pass protection, like passing off blitzes and stuff like that mm. would be maybe number one. And then that that run game is number two, because you got to deal with different personalities, different techniques, different angles every single time. And you really got to own that stuff. So, um, you know, I think Antonio Gibson's a very, very special talent. It's going to be really dangerous for a long time. But I think that group up front, when they're on, like he reaps the benefits of that. And I think, you know, everyone talks about Gibson, but McKissick's had a really yes. uh, been very nice in terms of filling in the role. And it seems to me like they're a little worried about him kind of got him on a pitch count a little bit it seems because Mm. you know he's not a big body guy so and he and he is so integral to that passing element of the offense that they gotta like um they gotta kind of watch what they do with him because you know i think there's a good example when um who's the backup running back uh number 34 peyton barber Barber. Barber. he was in on a a slant and he dropped it and that's not really what he's good at but he was kind of in there spelling mckissick and so you know he's he's so critical in the in the passing game you don't want him to get too banged up running the football so Yeah, and Logan, you were a big part of the 2012 team that won a bunch of games at the end of the year and ended up moving on to the playoffs. So I have to ask you, do you see any similarities between the 2012 team and this team? Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, when a team hits a run like this and they start playing with confidence, I I identify with that and I identify it with that 2012 team Mm. because I think that was one of the things that made the team so – good is we started believing in ourselves and you kind of feel that same level of confidence in terms of scheme in terms of identity I don't think it's that similar I think their defense is way better than what it was in 2012 and I think the offense is not quite as good as what it was in 2012 I think that offense in 2012 was super innovative and super ahead of its time and because now everyone's got these zone read packages and RPO packages and it kind of all that was the genesis of that, or maybe Cam Newton the year prior, right? Mm. So I think uh, from that standpoint, no, but in terms of kind of the momentum, the feel, like an under, a little bit, a roster that's a little under talented, but kind of outperforming the talent on the mm. roster, like the sum of the parts is, uh, is makes a better whole kind of thing. So I think that's, um, that that's where I see the similarities. Right. And uh, you kind of mentioned 2012 and everyone had such high hopes for that season, maybe like, yeah. I don't. I wouldn't say Super Bowl, but that's what the fan base was talking about. I mean, that's what and, we uh, felt on the team. Yeah, I mean, that's. Right I mean, honestly, that's yeah, what I was kind of feeling, yeah. especially going up two touchdowns. But yeah. um, ESPN Dominique Foxworth a couple of days ago, I thought this would kind of get more traction, but it didn't. Uh-huh. He kind of mentioned that next year, if the if we can get, I guess, competent quarterback play or just po- any type of positive quarterback play, that this team's Super Bowl window would kind of open up and we could kind of start making some runs. I just wanted to kind of get your opinion on that and maybe what do you think they need to add to make a kind of make this a Super Bowl or playoff contention? Right. I think it's so interesting when analysts say, oh, like confident, super confident quarterback play is the key to your right. Super Bowl. I think if you look at, I don't know, probably 90% of the teams in the NFL, like they feel that way. Even yeah. teams with good <laughs> quarterbacks are always looking for that elite right. game changing quarterback. You know, I think um, like look at the situation with Ryan Tannehill, how they cut him and now he's playing really well in Tennessee. Like you're always looking for an upgrade. You know, they, they bench the number two, number one pick Mariota or number two pick. And for Ryan Tan, it just is like this weird carousel. And there's no more important position in all of sports. So it's really easy for people to kind of throw out this blanket statement. Like, <laughs> Oh yeah, if we got better quarterback play, we'd be doing all right. And I don't right. disagree with that. Right. Like every week I'm kind of like, I do this thing. Like I kind of pretend to be a GM kind of thing. And I say, you know, who, would, if, how would this team look if we had 
like Russell Wilson playing quarterback, for example. Mm. And I think if you think of it like that, like kind of an elite, he's a top five quarterback. Yeah, this team looks way different. You know what I mean? Yeah. All these guys on the outs. And then if you put Haskins, for example, not killing Haskins here, but if you put him on the Seahawks, what does that team look like? Yeah. And it doesn't – And I, I, in my opinion, DK Metcalf doesn't have over 1,000 yards receiving. You're not talking about Lockett the same way. You're not talking about those guys. It's that elite quarterback that brings those guys to life. It helps the O line out, right? You know, like he makes those guys, he kind of elevates an average group, makes them, you know, you, you mentioned 2012. And one of the things I remember talking about with Sean McVay is like, Robert makes everyone on the team right now better. He hides all of our warts, all of the things that we're deficient in. Like, and I remember thinking about it and being like, you know, in this offense, because of how we do pass protections, how we do the run game, I could play here for 10 years because it, it covers up his, his play is kind of covering up all the deficiencies in my game. And that's what good quarterback play does, right? Is it helps kind of mask all these little weird little things, right? So in terms of what you need to do to get better, yeah, I think quarterback is probably the easiest thing, right? But then you look at every position and if you look at like, uh, let's just take Seattle, let's play this like uh, would you rather game, would you rather DK Metcalf or um, Scary Terry, you know, and I'd probably go Metcalf, right? I don't know. It just depends, right? You just you do that game, right? And so you say, if you do that game and you do it enough, you say everybody on this roster can be upgraded, right? It's just about, again, triaging, which is the most important element, right? And to me, right now, I'd say the offensive line, like they're playing well, but you can always upgrade there. I think you need a number two wide receiver. I think you need some like elite, maybe defensive backs, linebackers, like just roster depth, kind of filling that sucker out. But again, all those kind of uh, fill-ins aren't going to show up as being improvements until you get that good quarterback. You know what I mean? Or get, get a, get a quarterback that fits what you want to do and fits your identity, if that makes sense. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You're a hundred percent right. Um, you, you talked about the 2012 team and uh, the similarities now, you were such the 2012 team was, was definitely based around the offense. This team is strength is a defense. Right. It was kind of like RG three and Alfred Morris. And then this defensive line is kind of spearheading the way you were such a good all around tight end during your time in the NFL. What is it like trying to block somebody like a chase young or a Montez sweat? Did you ever have to go against anybody that athletic? I mean, you know, it's interesting. Like, you know, I got to go against uh, who I think is maybe the best pass rusher of the last 20 years and DeMarcus Ware and yes. Alden Smith when he was in his prime. Yeah. And one of those things those guys did extremely well was they were good athletes, but they also knew how to play with their length really well, which is something that like you see Montez this year, you know, his, <clears throat> excuse me, his production, I think it skyrocketed a little bit. And a lot of it's because he understands how to use those 36 and a half inch arms or 37 inch. <laughs> arms, you know what I mean? He can touch you from halfway across, across the room. And, you know, that's something that's really helped him in the run game. It's helped him as a pass rusher. And I think, um, and he, and he, the other thing that's interesting is to see his kind of, uh, his pass rushing plan, how that's evolved. He's kind of found his staple move and he's, he knows what he can work off of it. It's not super crazy. He's got like one or two really good moves, right. That he feels comfortable with, right. but they're really good. Like if you look at Ryan Kerrigan, for example, that guy's made a career out of like speed to power, right? I'm going to run up the field. I'm going to bull you. I've got really good long arm. And he's got to get into that, right? So, yeah. but Montez has done a nice job of kind of cultivating that element of his game and then kind of having a little derivative off of it. And it'd be really nice. You know, I know Chase Young got the Pro Bowl alternate, but I think as a pass rusher this year, he's been disappointing in my opinion. And, you know, he's a scary player. He's strong. He's a good athlete, all of these things. And it's really exciting. And he is going to be a game changing player for decades to come, right? Like, there's no doubt about it in my mind, but I would have liked to see this kind of. You know, like when you watch his college tape, for example, he had three, four moves that were really crisp mm. and really nice. And he had this great first step. And as a pass rusher this year, he didn't seem quite as dominant as I was hoping to see. Right. So in terms of blocking them, I wouldn't want to block either one of them. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> but um, uh, but in terms of their production this year, I think I'm looking forward for, you know, as, as good as Chase Young was this year, I'm really looking forward to next year when yeah. he's got an off season and he can work with, you know, kind of work on his craft a little bit more. Yeah, and Freddie from the HTVR podcast sent in a question. I actually wanted to bump it off of you, Logan, because for some reason in every game, the offense starts slow. Maybe not just the opening drive, but the first half. and the second half, they really start clicking. What is the reason for that? And then how do you change it? And then the third part of that question, when do you think that they'll actually score on the opening drive? Yeah, so it's so, it's so interesting to me because I come from – 
uh, a Kyle Shanahan offensive tree. And Kyle Shanahan used to script his first 25 plays. Mm. So that's not third down. That's not red zone. That's wow. in the field. These are the 25 plays I want to get to, right? So as an offensive player, you feel really confident and comfortable with those plays. And those are usually the ones you execute the best because you got the most rest, reps with them in practice. The quarterback feels good with them. Everyone feels good with them, right? So uh, the fact that they start so slow, I think is really kind of a unique conundrum to me because if anything, like you should be able to prep those plays and feel really good about them. Right. However, I, I think what I've noticed is that they seem to do best when they're out of their kind of base offense, when they're in kind of like, I don't want to say a hurry up or a two minute, but that kind of derivative, right? They're a little bit spread out. They're not kind of getting to runs. They're, they're just kind of dinking and dunking their way down the field, running zone beaters, running man beaters, simplifying their offense and kind of getting to their base package. And there are teams that are very successful with that. And so to me, I think like they're trying to establish kind of this, traditional offensive identity and especially in this last game it was really obvious right they kind of came out in some different personnel groupings and it was kind of good right but it was really sluggish and then they got in their two minute hurry up no huddle type stuff and it can kind of came to life for them and i think that's something that um i'm going to try and keep an eye on for the next couple games because i think that might be why i think they're much more comfortable coming out in kind of this uh more like college type Right. formation personnel grouping and if i'm scott turner i'm gonna lean into that you know i'm gonna say like this is who we are this is what we're good at like let's make this happen oh cool. and um so we're gonna i guess fast forward to sunday a little bit in this game on sunday um what is one thing that you think that washington needs to do to come out with a w whether it's offensive or defensive wise well it's you got me early in the week so i haven't watched a ton of carolina but what i will say is they need to get a little bit more consistent. We're going to talk about the quarterback again. Surprise, surprise. A little bit more consistent quarterback play. Just consistency. Because when Alex Smith is in there, like he's not beating the world, but he's consistent. He knows where to go with the football. He knows what the defense is trying to do. And in the second half, I will say, I thought Dwayne did that. And I was like, okay, you know, like this is good. Like this is not what you want from the 15th overall pick, but this is like maybe backup level kind of a guy who can win you some games type stuff that we need in this situation right now. And, um, and so if they, if you can get that kind of limit those turnovers, cause I, you know, besides those turnovers, like, you know, he wasn't getting a ton of help early from the receivers. There were right. some guys getting jammed up. So it's just some things that a fan wouldn't notice not having watched the L 22. So I don't think it's like burn the bridges with Dwayne Haskins. I don't think he's ever going to be a starter. I don't think he's what you don't think he's your answer, but I don't, I think he could maybe be a backup or something like that. Right. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so you need to get that kind of play from him. And, and I don't know <clears throat> if you can get it from him, to be totally honest. If you get it from him week in and week out, that's the thing that I'm the most kind of curious to see. Right. Yeah, I, I would completely agree. Um, so keeping up with the offense, Cam Sims has had a couple really big games this year. Uh, yeah. I know that in the past he's been somebody that us fans have always been waiting for to break out. The media has always hyped him up. Do you think that this guy could grab hold of that number two wide receiver position going forward? <laughs> Uh, you know, it's interesting. I think he's played himself well enough to to kind of have earned that opportunity. But like I said, like the NFL is always about, can you upgrade the position, right? Mm, right. And I think all of us would say yes, right? You know, you go out and you sign like, an, like just as an example, I'm not saying you should do this, but like an Amari two Cooper or even a Juju Smith, I think that would be a mistake. Right. But like, if you did that, is he the number two anymore? No, right? Like Terry's the number two or however, 1A, 1B, however you want to talk about that, right? And so if you upgrade the roster, which you probably should, then he should, he deserves to be on the team. He deserves an opportunity to make the roster next year, but like you can always get better. And then like, I, I, I said this to um, JP the other day on the, on our pregame show on 106.7, the fan. And like, if you, if you did this exchange game with the receivers down in Atlanta, does uh, right. Terry start on that team? Mm. And the answer I don't is, I don't know. I don't think so. Right. You got Calvin Ridley, who's yeah. over a thousand yards this year. And you got maybe one of the freakiest athletes I've ever been around in my whole career and Julio Jones. Right. Yeah. So even these guys that seem kind of impeachable in terms of their pedigree, like Ryan Kerrigan's a great example. Like the guy's been a pro bowler, like, you know, five or six times, but he, they upgraded, right. They mm. found someone better. And so I think right. like, that's what I always kind of go back to, like as much as you want to support him as a fan and you want the best, I want him to be the number two. Seems like a good dude, but ultimately you got to do what's best for the team and what's best for the roster. 
Yeah, and you alluded to earlier, Logan, how you kind of put your GM hat on. You put these yeah. players in other positions. And so the big topic of today, the big news of today, was the Dwayne Haskins scenario right. uh, about the pictures and everything that came about through social media. So, Logan, in, in, how would you handle it as a GM? Well, surprise, surprise. That's not the first time someone in the NFL has been to a strip club. But <laughs> <laughs> I, do think, I do think that um, – Given this current situation and what that means in terms of like COVID protocols, I think that's widely irresponsible by him. And I would be really irritated, especially, you know, like Ron Rivera, he just finished his cancer treatments. He's got like this depleted immune system. Like, right. like it's, he, I understand he's young, but in, like, this is one of those things like, you know, that they got him benched in the first place. Is he making, is he, is he handling the responsibility that comes with being, the number one quarterback for an NFL franchise appropriately. And this is something that I would say does not fall into that category, right? You kind of say to yourself, like, we've got two must win games. You are the starting quarterback right now. And now you might not be eligible to play in the game because you've not adhered to the NFL's COVID policies. So I think that um, I would be super ticked and I would talk to him about it if I was the GM and I would say, Dwayne, like, what the heck's going on here? And maybe he said, oh, I'm here for my grandmother's birthday or something. And I'd be like, okay, <laughs> great. Well, I'm glad we talked about it. <laughs> but um, but I, I think there should be some type of consequence for it, especially for a guy who has a history. History is probably a strong word, but kind right. of this, you know, mantra, a, a track, yeah, a track record of not being a true professional, right? Mm. And understanding the the magnitude of that position on an NFL team. And so, you know, like I said, not the first time a guy's been in the strip club, not the first time a starting quarterback's been to a strip club, you know, but um, it, it's the first time that it's going to get this much publicity because of the COVID stuff, because of the exposure to the team and what that means for the rest of the roster, especially if Alex Smith isn't healthy. So you would right. just put a potential winnable game in total jeopardy because you got to start a guy off the street um, or the practice squad quarterback because you wanted to, you know, see some naked girls, that doesn't really sit well with me. Yeah, yeah and uh, kind of keeping your uh, supposed GM hat on. Right. You've been keeping um, – you've been mentioning upgrading a lot of the position. So outside of quarterback, what do you think that this team needs to upgrade the most going into the offseason into next year? Um, like in terms of if I was triaging, right? Um, shoot, I would probably say – it's, it, this is difficult, right? Because you could say, like I, like I pointed out, you can upgrade at every position. Mm. But what I would probably start with is an elite lineman at some point because you're kind of aging out a little bit on the right side. You might be pricing yourself out on the right side with uh, Sheriff. So you need somebody in there. You know, obviously, um, uh, what's his name? The kid from LSU, uh, Charles. Yeah, yeah. Sadiq, Sadiq Charles. Charles. Sadiq Charles, obviously he – could be the answer there but you know he doesn't have a huge body of work to support that so i think you definitely in terms of building an identity and building a culture like the best teams i've been around are pretty set on the o-line you know mm -hmm. what i mean the teams that are in flux are they've they've kind of in they're in this situation where you know older guys are pricing themselves out mm -hmm. you know they're they're they they spend a ton of money on a guy in free agency that doesn't work out and they're just kind of bent over a barrel a little bit and it's not good for anybody so i think building through the draft that's a really important kind of uh, you know, cornerstone of any NFL team. And then I think if you're looking just at pure talent, I think you say maybe linebacker, can we get an upgrade there someplace? Mm -hmm. Safety. I think although those two guys, DeSager Everett, like I love him. He's one of my favorite players on the team. One of my favorite players I ever played with my whole career wow. is playing really well. Cameron Curl, right, doing a good job. So maybe you don't need to, but is the team better if you do? And I would say yes. You know, despite my, my affinity for both of those guys and their stories, like can you upgrade? Yes. And does that make the defense better? Yes. And then you say DB, maybe I think you're okay there. But again, if someone falls to you in the draft or there's a, or the price is right in free agency, do it, you know, and then obviously the number two wide receiver spot, I think is something that really needs to be addressed. Yeah, no, uh, I, I know uh, you're, we're getting ready to wrap up here with you. I know you got to go and you don't have to get into this too deep, but I'm just really curious based off of what Kyle said about the GM. Let's switch roles a little bit. If you are a player in that locker room, how do you feel about this whole situation? With, with the uh, with Dwayne. With Dwayne Askins thing? Yeah. Uh, the player, Logan Paulson, and the GM, Logan Paulson, probably feel the same. I think if the GM has to handle it a little bit more, uh, a little bit more tactfully. But mm -hmm. if I, as a player, I am, I am shocked, A, and B, right. I'm super irritated because not only are you messing with wins and losses, which – ultimately like i 
didn't really care about, but you're messing with my money a little bit. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Cause if you're not playing well, and if we don't have a quarterback, I'm not going to play well. And then we don't get the playoff bonus, which is also going to just really dig me a little bit. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, and it's all because of something that was totally in your control. Right. Mm-hmm. And if, it, if this was something outside of your control, like you got a car accident or you got COVID or whatever, like different, after the game you know you're like in a bubble like you're in like a media bubble and you're and everyone's watching you everyone in this town's watching you yeah i'm uh yeah i would be really hard for me as a player not to just say something to him and be really upset but i'm not there so it doesn't matter (laughs) now logan to wrap this up i know you uh you're a busy man you got stuff to do and i really appreciate you staying on a little bit longer but real quickly what are your keys to the victory on Sunday? I know you haven't watched the film yet on Carolina. You right. probably haven't watched that much on them. So if you don't want to have a prediction for the game on Sunday, what would what's your confidence level for the team, and what is their keys to victory of getting that? You know, it's interesting. My confidence level is not quite as high, I think, as most people. I think mm-hmm. they look at Carolina and they say this is a very winnable game, and I don't disagree with that, but I think Carolina is kind of one of those teams you don't want to be playing at this time of year. Mm-hmm. They've been classically overachieving this whole year. They run the ball okay. They've got a good good number one wide receiver. Teddy Bridwater has been good, you know what I mean? And he's and it's just like it's kind of one of those teams, they're better than San Francisco, but they're kind of built like San Francisco at this mm-hmm. point of the year. You know, they run the ball. They, they got – they're good – it's kind right. of scary. Mm-hmm. And so the thing that I think would be most important is just for this Washington football team, defensive line, linebackers, safeties to show that they can stop the run consistently. Mm. Cause that is something that like, and everyone says, Oh, look at this three game win streak. But like, if you look at Cincinnati, you look at uh, the Steelers, you look at even Dallas to a certain extent, like they did not have an opportunity or have any interest in running the football. So that, mm. that run defense statistic just goes through the roof. Right. And I think that, um, they really, 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 really need to show that they can do that if they want to be kind of this elite defensive group. Because, you know, and it's not all on that front four, but um, that's something that, like, characterizes good defense. It's like right now I, I kind of think the New York Giants defensive line is a little bit better, in my opinion, mm. because they have this ability to kind of say, you're not running the football. Like, they just played the number one rushing team in the NFL, and they held that guy to three yards of carry. You know what wow. I'm saying? Like, that is – that's a dominant group, right? right? And then they can create pressure artificially through pressures and stuff like that. So, but when you can't do that as a defensive front and they, everyone in the NFL knows it, like it doesn't matter how good you are at rushing the passer, partially because the offense is so bad, right? You're mm. never going to be in like these ahead situations. Like, right. I remember when I was in Atlanta, little story time here. Sorry, I know you guys got to go. But no, I don't gotta when go. I was in Atlanta, <laughs> like that was built around rushing the passer, right? right? Because they, with Kyle Shanahan, they were always in the lead, right? So they just, everyone was undersized. Everyone was built to cover. And then when they were in like some bare knuckle boxing matches and they had to like grid up and stop the run, they just didn't have enough weight in their pants to do it. You know mm. what I mean? And so I question that about this group. And I know that may be unfair of me, but that is something as a coach, if I'm the coach for Carolina, I'm saying we're going to run the ball 30 times and see what happens. We're just going to make wow. that group to stop it, show that they can do it. And up until this point, they haven't definitively done that. Everyone says, oh, what about, uh, you know, the 49ers? 49, like uh, most are average 4.6 yards a rush. Right. You don't want that. You know what I'm saying? Right. So uh, that's that's what I'm keeping my eye on for this game. Absolutely. Logan, this was an incredible interview. I can't thank you enough for giving us your time and your uh, opinions and the wisdom. Uh, absolutely <laughs> incredible stuff, Logan. And if you guys can, Go like and follow Logan Paulson, uh, Logan Paulson on Instagram at Logan underscore Paulson 82. I know it's like your new uh, account. Yeah. So uh, you post your film on there. So make sure you guys go and follow him on Instagram. I appreciate you bringing that up, guys. Thank you. This has been a lot of fun. Appreciate it, guys. Absolutely. Yeah, Logan, you were, it's Thank incredible. You. Uh, your uh, commentary is even better than your play. It's really great <laughs> stuff, sir. Mm-hmm. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Absolutely. You have a good night, brother. Thanks, man. Good talking to you guys. All right, All right brother. Easy. Appreciate it, man. All right, everybody, we just talked with Logan Paulson, former Washington football team player, and that was an absolute great interview, to say the least. So good. He's so smart. Yeah. So much wisdom. Yeah, man. He's he's a a real cool dude, too. That was awesome. Good. Shout out to Logan. That was a real good interview. Yeah. And so that being said, guys, let's get into the news of the day. Oh, (laughs) my goodness. There was was news today? What was going on? What news? What news happened? (laughs) 
Uh, Dwayne I got Haskins, some singers lined up for this one. <laughs> so pictures surfaced yet last night that Dwayne Haskins was in a club, possibly a strip club. Nobody really 100% knows where it went down. But then Ocean we, we kind of finding out through breadcrumbs and through investigative purposes, we find out that it was actually his girl's birthday party that he was out celebrating on Sunday night. He was there maskless. Uh, and getting into lots of trouble. And so now, today, earlier, Dwayne Haskins tweeted out an apology, uh, accepting guilt for what he had done. And then immediately, like, I, it almost was like he deleted his Twitter. But I have a feeling that he was just blocking people. Because a lot of people yeah. were saying he deleted it, but then I would look it up and find him. And so I'm like, oh, is he just blocking right. people? But such a careless and stupid act by Dwayne Haskins. You have to imagine there are guys on this team, especially Coach in particular, that could possibly be very affected and impacted by COVID. And you're going and doing this in the same week that you're supposed to be playing. You're supposed to be back to work. What are you doing? I cannot stand what the kind of mindset here, but I also want to take a step back and say, you know, there's no reason to kill the kid. We all make mistakes as a young guy. Um, but in my opinion, I think the captain Pat should be stripped from his chest. I said that earlier on Twitter because a captain should be reserved for somebody who puts the team's needs first. And if I'm Haskins possible second starting job, I'm saying, sorry, baby. I know we scheduled all this out, but you're going to have to go to the club without me. I got to go back to work. What about you, Hall? Do you agree that that captain chest should be taken off? Oh yeah. I mean, a hundred percent. And like you mentioned, the captain's reserve, sir, someone that's going to have the team's best interests first in their mind and solely in their mind. Clearly he was on some selfish soul, like selfish all about myself act. And like you said, even if he was like, you know what, let me step out for a little bit. You would think he would have the wherewithal to be like, Hey, everyone put your phones into a basket. Hey, no one take any pictures, blah, blah, blah. Be, be a little bit more discreet about it, which obviously doesn't make it right because you're still a kid at risk of exposing Right. Uh, your teammates and other people because you're still going out. But again, I'm not going to kill the guy for going out because he's a young dude. He has money and it's his girlfriend's birthday, whatever. With all that being said, why are you not wearing a mask? Like, you know, for a fact that you've already had issues with the COVID protocols before. Why would you even put yourself at risk to even have that even come up again? But I and that secondly, like Logan Paulson said, no, go ahead. No, I, I know that EB from the Junkies of 1067 had kind of alluded on Twitter earlier yeah, that yeah. there was a possibility that Haskins is the one quarterback that has the antibodies of COVID. So that's why he's running right. around doing whatever he wants without a care because he feels like he can't affect anybody. But the thing is, he's only worried about himself because he can still pass the right. virus onto others. Yeah. And so that's – if EB's It'll right, that makes kind of sense. <laughs> <laughs> but come on that was a good one that, that was a good one, one. A but good if eb's right that makes a lot of sense in my opinion because then it, it kind of explains his actions and feeling that he can do anything you know what i mean what about you reed right. but now yeah like logan paulson's, no, one more thing like logan paulson said though if i'm like a teammate and like in that locker room i'm definitely going to the coaches act i'm going to the other captains and being like yo man like this dude's got to go as far as a captain like it is what it is we can still have him around the team. Hopefully, we can mentor him, make him a better person yeah. from this. I don't want to cut him. That cap, that C on the chest. Yeah, that C on the chest, right. that's got to go. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't no, want to and- cut him. I think that he should stay with the team because I said it earlier, you know, that you want to be there for the click of a player. You know, you, you don't want to send him away and then that being the click that they make and turn into a pro. I feel like Dwayne does have a bright future, but the question is, how many clicks does it take to actually happen? And that's where you're kind of pressing the issue. And with Dwayne, with this being his second violation with the COVID protocols with the team, you have to imagine that the, the team's going to be kind of pissed. I wonder what Ron told him back after the first appearance uh, incident and what would happen to him if he got caught again. So I, I don't Probably I, didn't say, hey, man, it's cool if you go to a strip club. Yeah, I just don't think he's going to be cut. <laughs> I don't think he should be cut yet, uh, to say the least. But there's a good chance that he could be out for four weeks. So. We could not see Dwayne maybe for the rest of the season. Right. Now, am I, if I'm Ron, am I going to kill Dwayne for this? No, but Dwayne might end up killing his grandma just because of what, what he just did, going oh, out there getting no. COVID and stuff. You never know about that. Come on, man. You can't be doing that. You can't be doing that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily kill him for it. What I would do was be, I would give him a punishment, and that would be to not wear a face mask out on the field this Sunday mm-hmm. and get popped in the <laughs> face a couple of times. Um, I just don't understand how somebody can – pull a Steven Sims and just bobble every opportunity that they're given. It, it doesn't make sense to me. Dwayne is just, 
Like, he's Zangs is lined up. <laughs> <laughs> he's just he's just out there. He's, I mean, he's out there screwing this up. He gets so many opportunities. And, and if I'm a player in that locker room, I'm legitimately pissed. You know, Jonathan Allen's going to say something. You know, these guys who have been working so hard, they're in a position to make the playoffs. You know, Coach Ron literally just coached with cancer, and, and mm-hmm. they're in a position to win their division. And you go and pull something like that, and now all of a sudden we may have to pull a Denver Broncos. Not as bad of a situation. I get it. We yeah. want to have a wide receiver playing quarterback. But we could be screwed there. I, I mean, next week. Like, that's very, very, very immature. And, I mean, Dwayne, I don't understand what he's thinking. You should be wearing a mask in a strip club anyway around strippers. So, I don't know what he's what he was thinking. <laughs> it was just a dumb decision on his part. Yes, he's young. But you're the, you're the face of an NFL franchise. You were drafted in the first round. No, yeah. I shouldn't say face. But. You're the quarterback of an NFL franchise. Yeah. Like, at some point, dude, you got to understand what social media can do to you. My biggest thing is I just don't want people running with the whole notion that Dwayne was out celebrating a loss. I feel like that would that's kind of incorrect. Yeah, I feel right. like it's that's unfair dumb. to Dwayne. Right. But the thing is, yeah. is it actually makes the situation worse because that would it, that would say that it, this was planned out. And if it was planned out, why are you not dotting your T, dotting your I's and crossing your T's and making sure that the Everybody. people you're hanging with have been tested, that they're negative, that they can transmit it, making sure that whatever you're about to do will not get you in trouble. But he didn't do that. And it's a lack of self-awareness. And that's what the biggest issue with Dwayne is. Because last week, Dwayne talked to the media and said, being benched is the hardest thing I've done that's happened in my <laughs> life. Ron, Ron Rivera just had cancer. He's still getting over cancer. Alex Smith right. nearly died, and Jonathan Allen was on NFL Network last week talking about how he was raised in the foster care system. And you want to go tell the media that the hardest thing in your life was you getting benched as a professional? Lack of self-awareness, completely tone deaf, and it's, it's it reeks of somebody that needs a spanking. I hate to say it, but it's true. Right. No, no, it does. And, and I mean, speaking of awareness, that's exactly what you see on the football field with him, too. It's just a lack of awareness yeah. all around on his part. I don't know whether it's just it's like he's been pampered his whole life or what, but it was just a dumb decision. But you're right. He wasn't out there celebrating a loss, but it is. I think it rubs people wrong that it happened right after a tough loss. Um, so I, I understand that. But it's just Dwayne. I, I just it's so disappointing. I was literally just about to start giving him the benefit of the doubt yeah. and being like, you know what? I was kind of hard on him after he got benched. I feel bad for the kid. He's handled it. Well, he stayed out of the media. He's done. And then he goes and pulls this and it's just like, ah, Dwayne, what are yeah. you doing? I mean, I'm, I'm just so tired of even going. I'm going to even go back to like 20 years. I'll go back to 2012, eight years ago. It seems like every single time there's something good and positive building around the team on the field. And, in the locker room and everything's going great. There's something always off the field that has that deters that, and it's like it makes it stop talking about the positive things. That was my the point about the whole Chris like, Russell thing. That was my yeah, whole point like about 2012. The it's like, yeah, but I mean, I knew that was like true, but <laughs> now nah, 2012, like it's like, oh, we're going to win streak, wing streak. All of a sudden, you have all the chatter off the field about RG3 is going to the uh, to Dan Snyder's office and talking right. to him personally. He wants this kind of treatment. Blah 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 blah. 2015, we're in the midst of a playoff run, making the playoffs. What's the whole talk? Is Kirk a franchise quarterback? Are we going to pay him? What's going on? Blah, 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 blah. And now here we are again in the midst of a playoff run. Finally, things are going right, culture change, and you have the WAPO article. You have this. You have the Dan Snyder thing. Now you have new Dan Snyder news. Now you have the Dwayne Haskins thing throughout the whole season. It's just like at some point it's just like you just want to pull your hair out. I don't even have much left, but I'm going to pull it out. Right. Yeah, I just got a uh, $1.6 million Venmo sent us to stop talking <laughs> about this. <laughs> no, but uh, let's go to our fan questions because this kind of branches off into it. A really good friend of the podcast and big fan, uh, Tony Shivers, Tony the Tiger wants to know, do we think that the Haskins stuff will throw the team's focus off? And I'll start with you, Reed. Um, I don't think it'll necessarily throw the team's focus off. I think that the team is – very disappointed like logan said uh i i think that they have they, they could turn this and try to use it as motivation i mean ron's mass a master motivator i think there's a way that he could somehow flip this and get guys pumped um i don't think it'll be too distracting at least i i hope not because you're right hall it seems like anytime this team has something good going for them something like this happens and all of a sudden it's just they get the air sucked right out from them so i don't think so um but who knows with our track record maybe yeah, Tony, it's a great question. Yeah, um, it's a great question because I think it's probably the most difficult situation that Ron has uh, is going to be dealing with at the end of this season. 
And the reason I say that is because he's had, you know, they had the whole WAPO article come about the whole season, right? They had the name change. They've been able to stay focused about all of that. But this kind of situation is new. And so this is kind of out of the comfort zone, in my opinion. Right. But I think that we have the perfect coach, the right mindset, and the right players in that locker room for this not to be a thing. With Jonathan Allen in the building, Alex right. Smith in the building, Ron Rivera and Jack Del Rio, no-nonsense guys, and Terry McLaurin, they're not the type that just will dive into this and soak on it. They're going to make sure that those guys are focused. But the biggest issue is, what if some of the players on the team can't be with their family on for the holidays? And then Dwayne goes out and does this on Sunday. You know, like, right. what do you think the players think yeah. of that? And w will that uh, affect their focus? I think so. Um, as far as, like you just said, like a mental aspect, I don't think that it's going to affect them because, again, going back to the beginning of the season, whenever the whole controversy with ben Dwayne getting benched, obviously they were asked about it for numerous weeks going up to that or after that. And we seemed to right the ship eventually and get things rolling. Even in the games that we lost, obviously we were fighting hard. We were staying in games, coming back in games, whatever. But the uh, only way that I think it affects them is strictly from a football aspect is if Alex Smith can't play this weekend. And obviously they're not going to let Dwayne, Dwayne play because even though he, if he, even if he tests negative, there's, there's the still a risk of – yeah, there's still a risk of him going in there and exposing people and all that other good stuff. So, right. well, I guess bad stuff. But, yeah, the only way that it affects his team is on the football field if he can't play, if Alex right. Smith can't play, yep. because we got to start either an undrafted rookie or just a guy to be picked up off the street. They're saying just that they these, would start. For these purposes, crazy right. enough. That they would start Taylor Heineke. That's, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, and that's the crazy part about it. They picked him up for the COVID. They, they picked him up for COVID, like, purposes, and here we are two weeks later. COVID purposes. Right. Let's go on to our Kyle, next. Hacked into your database. Let's go on to our next question right. from the the great Andy Burrows in the UK. Oi, oi! He wants oi. to know who does the Washington football team go to if Alex Smith is not healthy enough to play in the game? Reed. Um. Obviously, I think we would all like to see Stephen Montez, uh, just because he was a, he was a pretty big name in college. Uh, we all saw what he was doing. Uh, no, I mean a lot. Of, I know a lot of people would, but he's hey, not he's, ready yet. By all yeah, by all accounts, exactly. he's not ready yet. So I personally am on, am on the page with Taylor Heineke. I think that that makes the most sense. He has some experience with Scott Turner after playing with him in 2018. Uh, he took over a few games for Cam Newton. He didn't have the best numbers, but all you need to do is just, I mean, it's not like the quarterbacks have been dominating games that, this year anyway. So all you got to do is just play smart football. So I'm going with Taylor Heineke. He should be the starter. Reports are right now that he will be the starter if Alex Smith can't go. So uh, yeah. Yeah, I have to agree with you um, because little tidbit, I was listening to 106.7 uh, earlier and a caller had called in who was a actual a Dominion uh, uh, grad and he's a big fan of Taylor Heineke. He talked about how Scott Turner brought Taylor Heineke to Minnesota when Scott was there and then Scott also brought him in when That's he right. was in Carolina. Yeah. So if he's going yeah, to go with anybody, point. it's going to be Taylor Heineke and Steven Montez does not have has zero snaps starting in the NFL. Zero. Right. That's why I would go with Heineke's a brief, a little bit more of experience and also has that gelling with the coordinator. That's an easy fit. So I, it's Heineke, in my opinion. What about Too you, Too important Hall? of a game. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if I had to pick one, which is like picking like a piece of trash out the garbage or a piece of which dog like, poop. Which is like picking going to a strip club or hanging out with 15 people in a closed environment. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. uh, I guess I'm going to go with Heineke just like you guys, just for the simple fact that he has a slight NFL experience. He knows what Scott Turner wants out of this offense, what he wants to do with the offense. He knows the playbook probably a little bit better than Steven Montez just because, again, Montez didn't get the whole offseason, all that other stuff. And, uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, obviously, I didn't watch any old Dominion games, but I definitely watched some Colorado games. I've seen Steven Montez. But with that being said, he was in the Pac-12, and he wasn't really like a barn burner in the Pac-12, which is right. not very hard. Mm. So, yeah. I mean, if I got to pick one, I guess I'm going with Heine Heineken, Heineke. Heine Heineken. Yeah, sure. Heineken. Uh, now, now let's move on to our next question uh, from Sergio Martin, our big fan over in Spain, whose daughter is now a Florida Gators fan. But he wants to know if it is Heineke. There you go. Do they focus on running the football and getting the ball strictly to Logan Thomas and Terry McLaurin, Reed? Um, yeah, I think that if it is Heineke, that they're going to push and push and push for Antonio Gibson to play. Uh, to provide an extra spark. Um, but, yeah, I think you have to get the ball to Logan Thomas and Terry McLaurin. Get the ball to your playmakers. Antonio Gibson, if he plays J.D. McKissick, you have to. And you have to play smart, 
turnover free football. And that's going to be, look, it's going to be tough. Carolina's defense isn't rated that high, but I mean, they got some good playmakers over there. Like Jeremy Chin has been fantastic. Uh, they, they've got some really good young pieces over there. So, I mean, it'll be tough, but as long as the defense does what they have been doing uh, during the win streak up until this past game and the offense doesn't turn the ball over, they could, they should be fine. Uh, and I really think that they could win this game. If it was against Seattle, I would say no possible way, but they, they could win this game with Heineke. And if they don't, and they end up missing the playoffs because of this, Dwayne, I'm yeah. sorry, but you're going to be the most hated DC sports yeah. fan, sports person since Bryce Harper. Yeah. Yeah, so Sergio, I, I do think they need to run the ball heavily and target those guys because this football team and this offense, even with Alex Smith at the helm, they were when they ran the ball well, when they had over 100 rushing yards, they won games. They need to go back to that formula, right. especially with Taylor Heineke running the football. Logan Thomas talked about it. I mean, Logan Paulson talked about it earlier. They have, if he was a coach or GM, he would be making sure that they are run, establishing the run more. And 100% that needs to happen because I thought that needed to happen with Dwayne. I thought the 55 passing attempts was too much. But at the same time, they the defense has to keep it close. They cannot go up. They cannot go down 20 to 3, forcing the offense to having to pass the ball and not run the ball. So I they do need to keep running the football, but it has to be close in order to do so. What about you, Hall? Yeah, I mean, if you look at the game plan through the wins that we've had throughout the season, it's been – play good defense and run the ball, control the clock, and take advantage of the shots when they're there. And I feel like that's what they did against um, Seattle on Sunday. It was a lot of Logan Thomas. Uh, they tried to get the ball to Terry McLaurin, but he had a couple drops, a couple pass breakups, and a lot of J.D. McKissick. And J.D. McKissick ran the ball fairly well for what I expected out of him. So I definitely think that'll be the game plan. And I, mean, I said it weeks ago that the sweet spot for this offense is the quarterback throwing the ball between – 22 to no more than 28 times maximum 30 if you're like in a two-minute warning you got to go and score last minute so uh, hopefully that uh even if they don't bring back Antonio Gibson I have a little bit minimal faith that Lamar Miller can step in and kind of be better than Peyton Barber's been he's he's a little bit better than Peyton Barber in the passing game as well so I just definitely think that uh with Heineke being the quarterback they don't really have to dumb down the offense this is about getting him comfortable and establishing the run, playing good defense, and pretty much uh, holding Carolina to under 20 points. If we can do that and hold them under 20, I think we have a good shot of winning. Yeah, so this next question is from Martin McLean and uh, Jesse. Our great questionnaire, Jesse and uh, Martin McLean. I'm going to combine these because they're, they're actually kind of the same. Martin McLean wants to know who's going to start at linebacker for the Washington football team this weekend. And then Jesse's question is, can the newly signed Michael Kendricks contribute at all with the Washington football team this week Reed I'll start with you um yeah that's a that's a tough one I don't know they, there's some options out that that they that they could realistically start but I mean I do think that they went out there and signed a veteran like Michael Kendricks for a reason will he start no I, I don't think he will this week but I'm not sure he's gonna start they've had such a big rotation of linebackers that, that it's tough to say um so yeah I don't I really I can tell you who's gonna yeah, start or who I think Tomorrow's going to be the biggest indicator. Wednesday, they're going to be back at right. practice. So we haven't really gotten an update yeah. on Cole Holcomb's concussion. Um, and then uh, it, was not, it wasn't John Bob. It was uh, Kevin Pierre-Lewis. We have to wait until yeah. tomorrow yeah. to really it, find out about them. So, right, yeah. You really don't know yet. Um, it's too early in the week, like Kyle said. But, I mean, obviously, Sean Dion Hamilton, Thomas Davis, these guys are all experienced linebackers. John Bostic, they're people who can't come in. So, Hopefully, I mean, Cole Holcomb's been on a tear, uh, so hopefully the play won't be too bad dropping off. But, I mean, it's going to be tough to replicate what he had done when he was playing. Yeah, and Jesse, yeah, I'll, uh, say, I'll say that Michael Kendricks, real quick, all I'll, all I'll say is I think that he was signed for special teams. You know, when you talk about the depth of linebacker being taken away with Sean Dion Hamilton and everything, you know, everyone just thinks about the defense, but the linebackers actually do a lot for special teams, especially the backups there. So I could see Michael Kendricks, that veteran, not necessarily being a starter or contributing on defense, but he could be a staple on the special teams at the linebacker spot for you. So that, that's very crucial, in my opinion. What about you, Hall? Yeah, no, I was just going to say pretty much what you guys said, where it's only Tuesday. Today was the off day, so we're not going to really know about the injuries and anything going forward until tomorrow, maybe even Thursday, towards the end of the week. But uh, I definitely think that with uh, Sean Dion Hamilton going to IR with the elbow injury, I definitely mm -hmm. think that Michael Kendricks, especially if uh, KPL or Holcomb can't go, 
I could definitely see Kendrick's maybe getting like a possible couple plays here and there just because like, I mean, we need depth and with those guys being out and Sean Dan hey, Sean Dion Hamilton just going to IR. We forgot he went to IR. Yeah, we kind of need another guy to step up. But at the end of the day, if if Michael Kendrick is getting on the field, defensive snaps, we're in trouble. Yeah, but I would I will say I would like to see a little bit of Khalid Hudson. I, I do think that yeah. Khalid Hudson has a lot of he ability. Did. He's somebody who could be very good in the passing game as well as as a former hybrid safety linebacker. I would love to see a lot more of Khalid Hudson if possible. Yeah, so let's keep it on that sentiment. You had to go. Let's go with the game beers and go to the blanket party. So, Reed, who's getting your game beer? Mm. Who's going to get my dream, my game beer for this one? I'm going to go with Deron Payne just because getting your first career interception off of a Montez SWAT tipped pass, and it's funny because Montez has about seven inches on on a, on a Russell Wilson, but uh, I'm, I'm going to go ahead. I'm just going to give it to the big fella. You know, he hasn't – he's kind of always seems to be the forgotten about defensive lineman with the seasons yeah. that Chase Young and Montez Sweat and Jonathan Allen are having. But I'm going to go with Deron Payne. Deron Payne getting his first career pick. Uh, he also he didn't play bad at all either. So I, I'm going to go with Deron Payne. Yeah, I already probably know who Hall's going to pick. So I'm going to go with Kalik Hudson. Uh, he's getting my game beer. The rookie started and he performed well. He was let he was tied for the team lead in tackles with eight with Cameron Curl, another rookie who's been balling out. Uh, but he played incredibly well. He was all over the field and in a crucial situation, he was able to tack the uh, uh, tackle the running back in the in the backfield to make it a second and 14, which really forced the punt and gave the Washington offense a, a chance to win that football game. So I think Cleek Hudson deserves the beer. I'm not sure if he's old enough, but enjoy it, sir. Kick your feet up and enjoy the game beer. What about you, Hall? Who do you think I was going to go with? Logan Thomas. No. It's too easy, even though the second one I'm going to go with is pretty easy anyway. But I just mentioned him in the last uh, fan question. My guy, J.D. McKissick, and it's slightly – well, not even slightly. It's mostly personal. Uh, I had him in fantasy football this weekend. <laughs> he definitely killed it for me, him and Logan Thomas. So I definitely can give uh, Logan Thomas a game beer as well. But like I said, that's too easy because he's definitely balled yeah, out. Yeah, he had a career But J.D. Day. McKissick over 100 – yeah, J.D. McKissick over 100 yards total from scrimmage. Had the touchdown to get us back into the game. Uh, had some great uh, pickups in the pass blocking game. And, yeah, like I said, he I expected him to come out and not obviously be Antonio Gibson in the run game, but he did more than exceptionally well than I thought he would in the run game. And, yeah, I mean, like I said, he just came out and did his thing and kick your feet up, enjoy the beer, and we need you to come out this week and do the same thing, if not better. Yeah, absolutely. Now, the blanket party is kind of hard because, like, I don't really know who to blame for this game i don't think anybody really deserves no. it and I, I look i know that i was very emotional about the dustin hopkins extra point but look the watch the, the team had a chance to win that football game Dwayne haskins two picks yeah. had a foot had a deal with it the defense not stopping the run had a huge deal uh had a deal with it so i, I think it's a total team loss so if anyone's getting a blanket party it's the team they should have played better in that first half they would have been in a better position to win that football game they could have easily won that football game. They did not get after Russell Wilson. But do you guys have anybody in mind you'd give the blanket party to? Yeah, um, I, I'm just going to go with uh, Dustin Hopkins. I think that it was just a chain reaction of things. It, it was just he misses that extra point, which forces us to go for two, which is a missed opportunity. If he would have made that extra point, we wouldn't have had to go for two. We could have kicked another extra point, assuming he made that. Then on that final drive, we're in field goal range. You kick the field goal for the tie, take it try to go to overtime. Um, so I'm going to just give it to Dustin Hopkins just because, I mean, I know he's been dealing with injuries. Uh, obviously something's going on because he's not nearly as reliable as he's always been. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's just, I think it was just a chain reaction of things, but you can give it to a lot of guys this week. Um, I mean, if I guess I had to do it, give it to anyone, I would probably just give it to like the front seven as a whole. I thought you were going to say Just Dwayne. because the key to that, the, nah, uh, it's too easy again. Uh, but, yeah, just as a whole, I feel like going into that game, we knew that we had to contain Russell Wilson, not over rush and not get out of our uh, defensive gap assignments and landing assignments. And obviously they did it a couple times, especially on that huge run Russell Wilson had. Uh, Chris Carson had a pretty decent game. The Carlos Hyde run was just unacceptable. Right. So I would give it to the front seven just because those three to four plays that I just mentioned yep. were pretty much the key to the difference of the game. Yeah, yeah, real fast. Uh, I don't think anybody gave a uh, blanket party to Dwayne Haskins because he's not going to cover up. <laughs> Absolutely ridiculous. Oh, hey, but let's the finish. King. Let's finish this episode with a question 
from uh, Scott Hartley. And the reason why I wanted, I wanted to finish it with this, because it's a really good one, who holds the biggest key to victory for the Washington football team on Sunday? And he prefaced it by saying that he thinks it's Morgan Moses. If Morgan Moses can't play on Sunday, he thinks that's going to be a huge concern for the offensive line. So, Reed, I'll start with you. Uh, yeah, I, I completely agree with him. I, I think that Morgan Moses is going to be huge. But uh, I'm going to go with the, uh, obviously, I mean, the elephant in the room, the easy one, the quarterback position, just because that's such an important position. And, look, there's been games where the quarterbacks have not played well at all, and we still ended up winning. But throwing somebody back there like Taylor Heineke, who doesn't have much NFL experience, who, I mean, I, quite frankly, isn't a starting quarterback. There's a reason he wasn't on a roster before this. Um it's definitely worrisome. Um, do I think they could still pull it off? Absolutely. I, I really do, uh, especially with the way that the defense have been playing. But, and as long as they keep it simple for them. But to me, that's just very worrisome. And I know that that's easy, but it, I feel like that's too big to ignore. Yeah, for me, it's Cole Holcomb. Uh, you saw last uh, against the Seahawks uh, that they were able it. to run the ball at will. And without Cole Holcomb being there, that was able to go down. Uh, when he was in the game against the past three teams, they did really well against the run. And they did relatively well yep. on Sunday, but it was those big plays in the running game that really butchered them. And so I think if Cole Holcomb plays on Sunday, they're in a very good chance to win. It, like Logan Paulson has said earlier, it all comes down to stopping the run. If they get gashed through the running game, that's when they're typically losing games and in these bad scenarios. So Cole Holcomb is the key player for me. Sorry, Hall. <laughs> yeah, it's all good. Great line, great minds think alike. So I'll just keen to kind of keep it in the same aspect as you, where it has to be the defensive line. I think that the front four is going to have to dominate the offensive line of the Panthers. They're going to have to uh, get pressure on Teddy Bridgewater and kind of the same mentality of Russell Wilson, where you can't overrush. Got to stay in your, um, your, you got to stay in your lanes rushing and yeah, you got to get pressure on Teddy because again, and these past, all these wins that we had this season, the six wins, the defensive line has dominated. They've gotten pressure. They've gotten the quarterback off their mark. And they put pressure, swatted the ball, and gotten sex. So I'm going to go with the gotten front what? four. The front four or five. The five-man five rotation. Yeah. yeah that's um, let's, let's also not forget how important that is all because Carolina has two very good wide receivers yes, that are sir. playing very well. And Joe Brady, their passing attack, it's just so well organized and, and so well constructed that you got to get – pressure on Teddy he's a smart quarterback yeah yep. and a thank you to everyone for your fan questions the HT we are Freddie Ham uh Tom Sawi uh Sharp Sharp Eye Washington Tay and Todd's podcast I'm saving your questions for Thursday show which is an actual pregame show for the game I really like your questions I'm going to use them on Thursday I promise you I did not forget about you okay everyone else Jesse Andy Tony Sergio uh Martin McLean thank you so much for your fan questions today guys um, make sure you check us out on Thursday. We're going to have a great show lined up for you. And, of course, thank you to Logan Paulson for being able to come on. And that was a phenomenal interview. That was uh, such a good uh, time because I learned a lot. You know, like l listening to him mm -hmm. talk about the game, you feel like you're absorbing information. So much yeah, he's much definitely he definitely could be like a tight end coach in the future or something like that. Yeah. I can definitely see that if he wants to. I love his breakdowns. Yeah. Yeah, or he could be like a hair model. You see that? Beautiful hair. <laughs> yeah. great, great head of hair. Great, great head of hair. Funny because I used to always like associate like Logan Paulson. Obviously, I knew his number. I knew who he was as a player. Oh. But I always be like, oh, he's the dude with the the hair hanging out the back of the helmet. But <laughs> you, I didn't know he still had long hair because I know never saw getting, his face before. So. You know who's getting the blanket party? You two for picking Washington. Both of y'all picking Washington to lose for the game. Told you guys. You should it's only, only one. Of one. Yeah, one of us yeah, has yeah. to do it. Not both. You only guys ruined it. So who's going to be the one on Thursday? That's the real question. Who's going to be the one on Thursday? Yeah. Whoever gets there first is going to have to do it. And then <laughs> the other person. I'll let you guys fight. I'll let you something. guys fight over it. <laughs> Winner gets the porky pig. <laughs> All right. You've uh, been tuning into the Mike and Mike podcast. Yeah, that's <laughs> 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 Thank you for turning into the Mike zone. <laughs> the Mike zone. <laughs> All right, everybody, please go like and subscribe and rate us on iTunes, on YouTube, Facebook, Spotify, Google Pods, Twitter, Instagram. We're all over the place. Remember, please go and uh, go follow Logan Paulson, Logan underscore Paulson 82 on Instagram. Make sure you go follow him. He posts his, his film breakdowns. He does a very, very good job at it. Obviously, he knows what he's talking about. All right, everybody, we'll see you on Thursday. I'm Kyle. I'm Hall.
And I'm Reed. That's all. That's all I'm saying this week. That's all you're saying this week? I was expecting yeah. something. All right, everybody. We'll see you on Thursday. I was mm-hmm. expecting, a, expecting a Dwayne zing, honestly. Yeah. yeah it'll happen again. Don't worry. It'll be <laughs> all right, everybody. Thing. Washington football. <laughs> Woo! Washington football. Woo!